In our world, the dream is a purely biological phenomenon. However, in the world of fiction, dreams can be a very powerful narrative to- No! No! I'm not going back! I'm not going back! Back, damn you! I'm not going back, damn it! Who needs intros? You've seen the first chapter. No, 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 no. It's my show now, okay? That guy's name is Flaw Peacock. My name is Zero Given, but you can call me Fox. Zero Face Given. My whole altar so it is without its sacrifices. Merrily I believe every waltz that I'm sleep is worth it. It's nice to finally meet ya here in the realm of good lighting. But we don't need this outfit. One moment. That's better. You'll come to find that I really like puzzles. Let's get right into the video. If you haven't seen my chapter one video yet, I highly recommend you watch that one first, give you a lot of context for chapter two, and in general, it'll help you understand my process of how I'm gonna go about these videos. How do I put this delicately? Chapter two takes place in a dream. Now, don't click off just yet. This chapter, despite it being a dream, is chock full of some of the most rich contexts and lore and storytelling. I'm talking foreshadowing, prophecy, things of that sort. Yes, it takes place in a dream, but chapter three would be just sights, sounds, and images without chapter two's context and prophecy and all that stuff. In fact, I think we will come to find out that the dream is really a nightmare, a onslaught, a mental and spiritual onslaught that's being levied against Father Ward by this second death cult, which, yeah, spoiler alert, that's the name of this cult. We get a brief mention of it in the offering ending at the end of chapter one. So I'll be using information that we went over in chapter one, so that's why it's of absolute paramount importance paramount importance that you understand the key to all of this, which is the context that chapter one gives us. So there, that's it. You now know that it's a dream. Uh, I don't have to go back and explain everything and recontextualize it in its dream format. You know it now and we can move on and get the full context of chapter two's amazing story. You unlock a prologue for chapter two after completing chapter two. So I'm going to go through the prologue first because it leads right into it. And like before, I'm going to play it normally and any details, notes, and whatnot that I may have missed, I will go over those separately towards the end. We're going to separate this basically into prologue, chapter two, and then the chapter two bad ending. We start the prologue off with Father Ward at the scene of a car accident. We follow the tire marks to the right and find the other car in the accident. It's a pickup truck with red covering the broken glass of the passenger window. Now, apparently you can interact with the truck and see here that it was in fact a man smiling, uh, motionless, but I tried in previous playthroughs and I just couldn't get it to work. I just didn't know that was a thing you could do until now. We investigate another screen over and find nothing. Coming back, we see that the inside of the car is empty. The red that we were seeing was a person still in the car, blasted Atari graphics, and their blood trail heads north. This creepy person that's in the car made its way into the cornfields. We make it back to the central screen to find our car caught on fire. This smells fishy, almost as if this accident was premeditated. We head north, deeper into the cornfields, and there's that red guy that was in the truck. He runs deeper north. We find a scarecrow. Exercising it doesn't do anything, but further examining it shows it seems to be bleeding out of its right eye. We head deeper into the cornfields in one direction to face the cornfield demon. We track it by looking at the corn stalks it's interacting with and walking through. We then point our cross in its direction, revealing it. It then teleports to some random point in the map and darts straight for us. There's no use in running, so we must position ourselves very briefly and then immediately point our cross at it. It doesn't take much to defeat it in these instances. We return to the scarecrow and it's changed. The eye hole it was previously bleeding from has grown in size and a creepy triangular smile is forming at the bottom of its face. 
We repeat the steps of beating the cornfield demon, coming back to the scarecrow, noticing its changes. We do this in a total of three times, and then the cornfield demon is officially defeated. We head further north and we see a gruesome sight. We see what seems to be the corpse of a dog and these two stick-like figures. We will keep these stick figures in mind. Exercising the dog reveals note eight. The note is an account of somebody who works at the Snake Meadow Hill Church. The children she's referring to are orphans who are under the care of the church attached orphanage. The account notes terrifying sounds coming from the cornfields. Eventually, on one night when the noises were particularly intense and close to the church, the dogs broke into a panic. One of them, Greta, broke loose and ran straight into the cornfield, and it seemed that whatever was making that noise was placated. Until a couple of days later, the author of this note stumbled upon the corpse of Greta in the morning. Being that we get access to this note after defeating the cornfield demon, I think it's safe to say that this heinous act was done by the cornfield demon. And the corpse that lays before us is none other than Greta. Going north one more screen takes us to six graves and a statue of a saint watching over the graves alongside two more of those stick-like figures. Exercising the statue reveals note 29, a morbid account. Our author laments six children not listening to them going far into the cornfields. They mention that some of these boxes are empty, that the remains are so scattered that they couldn't fill the boxes. The author promises that after they are done with this morbid task, that they are swearing off the ministry or whatever service that they did for this church, and that they don't want to see anyone from the church ever again, not even, and I quote, that girl who stayed inside the house last night. We will be keeping this prodigal minister in mind. Going north once more takes us to a dilapidated church. This is Snake Hill Meadow Church, and if the name sounds familiar, that's because it shares the same name as the road that the Martin household is off of. The church, as well as the street, play a vital role in this story's background and inception. We will be keeping this combination church and orphanage in mind. The screen says death awaits as we enter the church. We pick up note 30. This is an account of somebody associated with the church, years after the incident with the children. The author mentions the acceptance of a new volunteer, a nun named Sister Miriam Bell. With the completion of the staff, the orphanage has been cleared to move in a new group of children, three next week and three sometime next month. To avoid any confusion, this new set of six orphans are not the orphans whose graves we saw earlier. Those graves are of the orphans that suffered under the incident the author is talking about. We will be keeping Sister Miriam in mind, as well as these two separate sets of six orphanids. Orphanids? Orphans. We head to the left to exercise the chalice demon. Defeating it drops note 31. The account in these notes starts off glowingly praising Sister Bell's hard work and cheery disposition, doling over the new orphans consistently. But next paragraph, the author makes a note of Sister Bell's strange behavior. One account is of the children dancing in a circle around Sister Bell while she stares into the sky. And another account was of them standing at the edge of the cornfield looking in as Sister Bell spoke to them from within the corn maze. The author also notes that Sister Bell seemed to instantly know her way around the church. We head deeper into the church to find a cross with the phrase, Not shall kill thou written on it with red substance, a jumbled up version of the commandment, thou shalt not kill. We enter the main area where mass is typically held, the chapel. We find note 32, an account of a detective right before his retirement. He was assigned to investigate the disappearance of four missing orphans, Sister Miriam Bell, and the strange death of an unnamed nun. All of the staff are terrified, except Father Clark, who helped the investigator search. The account ends with him questioning the two kids that slept through the disappearance. They claim that Sister Miriam Bell isn't actually gone. When the detective asks, well then where is she? They look at each other, then back at him, telling him to ask her himself. We head in deeper into the chapel towards the pulpit, and we see four red people sitting in the front pews. We head to the left room with a confessional in it. In the corner of our eye, we see this ghost in the window, but instead of investigating this room, we head to the right to find a hallway with an icon of the Theotokos. Sorry, I just wanted to say the word Theotokos. It's an icon of the Virgin Mary. And again, we see that weird lanky ghost again. 
We exercise the icon and head back only to fend off an ambush from what seems to be this fanatic. Now is the best time to reveal that the actual name for these enemies is Thrall. They aren't actually cultists, they're sort of the lowest level fodder for the second death cult. And when they kill you they say chaos reigns psh, 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 and then they like stab you to death. In chapter one that ritualistic site with the sacrificial fox on it, if you approach that fox uh, before entering the Martin household you will even hear chaos reigns. So this is the same saying, and what was once this reference to this the Lars von Trier movie Antichrist is now a part of the you know the, this cult, this antagonist of cults lexicon. We will be keeping this enemy type thralls and their catchphrase chaos reigns in mind. We find note 33. It's unclear who is writing this, but since it fails to mention any disappearances, I don't believe it's the detective. They mention handmade, life-size dolls made of sticks being left around the property. The children are shouting that they see Miriam in the cornfields. The note ends with a mention of the author's nightmares about standing outside the church, seeing people painted red looking at him from the cornfields. This description sounds a lot like the red folks we've been seeing. So these stick dolls sound a lot like these stick figures that we've been seeing, and in fact they are. So we will, from now on, be keeping these stick dolls in mind. So we go back to the left, to the confessional room, to find that the skull that sat there had turned purple. We exercise the skull, fend off another fanatic, and back in the main church area we find note 34. We also notice that this trap door is slowly opening to reveal stairs. The note is another account of the detective. He clarifies in the first paragraph that the children he talked to were twins, and that there were four handmade dolls, one for each missing child. At two in the morning, him and the rest of the church are woken up by cackling, coming from the painting of the Virgin Mary. They hear a loud noise in the chapel and see Miriam dragging the kids down into the basement. The detective doesn't clarify which kids these are, but. I believe these are the remaining twins. Father Clark goes down into the basement alone to face Sister Miriam and the basement trapdoor closes behind him. The detective proceeds to hear indescribable noises and urges anybody reading these notes to not go in the basement. So underneath the orphanage and church combination, we have a basement. And in that secret basement, we have Father Clark. We will be keeping Father Clark in mind and in our prayers. I do find it pretty interesting. In a previous note, we see a religious minister saying that they don't believe in the devil anymore. And now we see this more or less secular detective saying that they now truly believe in the devil. So that tells us that whatever horror lies here is scary enough to scare the faith into people and out of people. And the associate before mentions that Sister Miriam Bell knows her way around the church very well. So I'm wondering if the secret basement was something that only she was aware of. Because it seems odd that none of the associates, including Father Clark, would have initially suggested to look in the basement. You would assume that they would have looked everywhere. That's what kind of led them to sort of this dead end. That would probably be like the first place they look when looking for missing children. So I, I, part of me believes that Father Clark and all the other uh, administrators and ministers and whatnot had no idea of the secret basement, which is brings so many questions. Like, how does Sister Miriam know about this place? And it's just, I mean, you know, demon knowledge. We head back up to the pulpit area and notice that one of those grayed out glass icons had been colored in. We exercise this sacrilegious glass icon and the fanatics start freaking out and twitching their heads. Before things get too squirrely, we head down to the basement. Darkness surrounds us. We pick up a flashlight and proceed with one of the most frustrating but terrifying demon fights in this game. The basement demon is fought like any other demon, but you have to be vigilant because it utilizes the darkness very well. In this fight, you may see apparitions of the lanky dark man that we saw earlier, uh, the twins, and uh, or, or lone children running up and down side to side across your flashlight beam. After defeating the demon, we see Sister Miriam, or at least an apparition of her, backing away from us. We read the final note of the prologue, which is basically a cryptic set of instructions on what to do to get a secret ending for this prologue. 
We go back up to the chapel to see the twins, and as we approach them, we see Sister Miriam appear. She says, here I am, and the screen cuts black, and then you hear, my little ones. Now hold on one second. If you listen closely, she's saying, my little one, not my little ones. I'm just realizing this while editing, and uh, this, uh, this is, uh, well, you know, there's two twins, and there's only one of Father Ward, so my little one might be referring to Father Ward. I mean, who else? Anyways, we will be keeping that in mind. There is a secret ending to this prologue that... There is a secret ending to this prologue that requires you to get a score of 666. In order to get this score, you have to fight off all the enemies, collect all the notes, look into all the areas. It's like you have to be super thorough. And then on top of that, you have to complete this ritual that's explained cryptically in that final note in the prologue. I blundered. I tried a few times to do this end sequence and I missed one step and that one step was to exercise the scarecrow. So I will be describing it to you, uh, but I'll be using screenshots and pictures I found on the internet. If you want to see this sequence for yourself, I will put a link in the description below for a video that goes into that. I'd rather you give those guys the view. I don't want to rip their video and put it on my video. I'd rather you guys give them the view. And besides, there's not a lot of lore to extract from it anyway, so that's why I didn't really go back and do the whole prologue over again, because I just, I really hate the basement demon. So for this secret ending, you want to make sure that you get a score of 666. So basically, you read all the notes, exercise all the finesse, just do everything that this prologue has to offer. And then you want to finish off with this ritual. So after defeating the basement demon, head back to the scarecrow. I forgot this step, and this is what caused so many of my failures. You're supposed to exercise the scarecrow. After that, head back to the burning car, light Father Ward on fire, then immediately rush to the scarecrow to light it on fire. I kept dying at this point because I didn't previously exercise the scarecrow. Once you do this, you will see the twins, or at least what I think to be are a representation of the twins. It's probably best I say this now, what I failed to mention in chapter one, if you are having trouble finding landmarks and locations, you will actually see the twins guiding you to the shed and the Martin household. Even though in chapter one, those sprites represent the twins, in this instance, you see nine other of these children sprites approaching this ritual. Suddenly, we're transformed into what looks like a demonic furball surrounded by nine of those stick dolls, one for each of the children that surrounded that ritual site. Notwithstanding the children holding hands, I think because the children holding hands are something that's uniquely for Father Ward, his uh, struggle to find the twins. But the nine children that came around that ritual site were specifically relevant to that location. We wander around in our demon form until we come face to face with Sister Miriam Bell, flanked by six stick dolls. She turns around, shows her face, screams at us, and the cutscene ends, taking us to chapter two. So, the purpose of the prologue is just a vehicle for lore pieces and narrative pieces and things like that. It's canon. You know, there's nothing telling us it's not canon. Uh, there's nothing explicitly telling us that it's a dream. Uh, however, just like logically speaking, like how would we be there during the time of all this? It's, it still definitely has all the ingredients of a father war dream. I almost feel like this prologue is like the proto-dream for the dream of chapter two, because it's literally the demo for chapter two. But it's still very important that we've gone over it because we get some very juicy information about Sister Miriam Bell, who will be a, a Deuter antagonist, basically like the side antagonist like of the whole cult. She's very important, who will play a huge role as far as just seed sowing in just the plot in general. Just like we did in chapter one, let's go ahead and give a short synopsis of chapter two prologue so that we can head straight into chapter two with as much data as possible. On the same road that the Martin House lies on is the Snake Meadow Hill Church. Within the church is also an orphanage. Just like the Martin household, this church seems to be the precipice for all sorts of just horrific demonic skull duggery from 
murdering dogs to murdering children. We know of six children that were murdered by the cornfield demon. And I'm kind of jumping the shark here, but I do want to point out in case I forget, we actually do not know the certain fate of the six orphans um, that were kidnapped by Sister Miriam Bell. So I want to point that out right now. Now, despite this reputation for the orphanage, Sister Miriam Bell still applies, completing the staffing required to get these new set of six orphans. Sister Miriam Bell is accepted into the fold, and she knows her place around the church very well. The children are absolutely enthralled by her. I don't know if this is going to be important. I, I feel like for theming purposes, and it's going to be important, but we have to do, we do want to point out there are twins. There are a set of twins in that second set of orphans. One night, four of the six orphans go missing. An investigation goes underway. We're introduced to a detective. And then one night at 2 a.m., Sister Miriam is seen dragging the remaining two ch uh, children into the secret basement. This is following the church hearing cackling coming from this room within the church that has this Virgin Mary painting there. I guess we should keep that in mind too. So let's keep that picture of the Virgin Mary with the laughing, the cackling coming out of it. We'll keep that in mind too. So Sister Miriam now has all of the children in her demonic custody. Father Clark follows her into the secret basement. This is the last we hear of him uh, within the prologue. And like I said, we don't entirely know the fate of these six orphans, at least not yet. Sister Miriam is going to play a huge role. She is bad news. Okay, here. I think it's also important to point out now in case I didn't make the point clear earlier, the children that you see running around, with the exception of the ones you see in chapter one, those are not the same as the twins. If you see the children standing still holding hands with each other, that is an apparition, a vision, a bilocation of the twins. But these, from here on out, when you see a kid out of the corner of your eye as Father Ward, that's separate from the twins. These will be used to symbolize basically the child version of what these stick dolls symbolize, and that is victims of the cult, either recruits, uh, sacrifice victims, murder victims, just in general, the stick doll represents a victim, a doomed person, and the child represents a doomed child. I'm kind of jumping the shark by saying doomed child, but we'll get to that. And as I said earlier, I'm of the mind that this is a nightmare that Father Ward is having, and after this nightmare, we get into the nightmare of chapter two. We start chapter two, and Hold on, this isn't Father Ward. This is that gray man, Father Garcia. Well, that's, that's pretty neat. The note we find is a copy of the note from chapter one, the note dropped by the white emaciated creature, Michael. We enter Father Garcia's kitchen to see three different photos of what we will come to find out is Michael Davies. Michael Davies, after one day in Father Garcia's care, looks like any other kid. But already at two weeks, the photo of Michael shows gray vein-like patterns around red eyes. And it's hard to tell with the Atari graphics, but it even looks like he's been missing teeth and his hair is thinning. And it seems that the transformation is complete in the final picture. After three months in Father Garcia's care, the possession has still taken full effect, transforming the poor child into the abomination that we killed in chapter one. Um, I want to take a moment to point something out because what we're about to see may be very upsetting. The world of faith mystically is not like our world. And I'm, I'm gonna be talking, kind of assuming that there is a mysticality to our world. Exorcisms in our world are typically or ideally approached with more nuance, more holistically. You see similar rites like cleansing and smudging and whatnot across different faiths, even among the scope of the Abrahamic religions. And we're all familiar with the scandals of the gross application of the rite of exorcism. So if we took that familiarity and we applied it to Father Garcia, it would paint him in a very villainous light. Rightfully so. The situation you're about to see Michael in would make it very easy to classify Father Garcia as a villain. But in the world of faith, there really isn't any nuance. Demons are not concerned with things like temptation and slightly tipping the scales in favor of evil. There's just a full frontal assault on human bodies, 
human physicalities, human sensibilities, structures, and all that stuff. Michael is quite literally infected with a mystical parasite. And this mystical species is having physical effects on Michael's body. We are going to see Michael restrained in that typical fashion that we've seen in those bombastic, crazy exorcism movies. And it's going to seem very neglectful, very abusive to see Michael in that situation. But you're going to come to find out that the amount of, of control that this mystical parasite has on Michael, it would be neglectful to not have anybody affected by this parasite restrained. This dialogue we're having is very akin to the dialogue that Father Garcia was having with, uh, what was it? Not Father Allred. Father, I forget the father's name. I'll put it up on the screen if, if I remember it. What we're about to see, and frankly, what we've seen in chapter one, I think proves my point that Michael is possessed. Michael is under control from this mystical parasite. And we have to do all the means possible to mitigate the damage that this can do, not only to his body, but to bodies around him. We see that familiar emaciated Michael restrained to a bed, crucifixes surrounding him. We begin exercising Michael. Red trickles start to form around him until suddenly he breaks free, screaming with the same voice he spoke with in chapter one, entering that familiar all four spider stance. The lights cut out, but Father Garcia is still alive. We fumble about to look for a light or a switch, but then the lights come back on and we see Michael in his full possession form skittering away upstairs. We go back to the kitchen to find the three month picture missing. This is likely the missing picture that would have been attached to the letter to Cardinal Gifford. Is this demon intelligent enough to know that stealing this evidence will help prevent Father Garcia from establishing any sort of legitimacy of the Davies case with the Vatican? Now, this is going to be minor conjecture. I want to include this because basically the story of Michael has come to a close. The fact that Father Garcia doesn't get immediately killed after Michael or possessed Michael breaks out of his restraints, I think that tells me that Michael has some level of control. Michael does like Father Garcia, does maybe even appreciate the work that Father Garcia is doing to save him, sees him as a friend, a familiar. We even see in the father and son ending of chapter one, if we, for some reason, as Father Ward, kill Father Garcia, Michael lays in wait in the back of our car and kills us in what I believe is to be an act of revenge. Maybe it's not Michael killing us, but it's Michael letting go and letting the demon kill us because it wants to kill all priests on earth. It's a demon for crying out loud. Out of a sort of vengeance against Father Ward who would have killed Father Garcia. So I wanted to bring that up because I think this is a minor bit of evidence that we can use to prove that Father Garcia is not a villainous character. And although after the canonical ending of chapter one, Michael Davies' story comes to a very sad and brutal close, we still need to keep Father Garcia in mind. Pochino. We see a rotoscoped cutscene of Michael cannibalizing somebody. Dios mio, what have you done? Father Garcia promises the demon will feel God's wrath. Then hits the gritty so hard his Roman collar disappears. Now, based on my educated guess, I think that this goofy air ah, runs. Now, I think this goofy air ah, run cycle. <laughs> now, based. Now, based on this goofy air ah, run cycle, we can deduce that the gray man in chapter one is in fact Father Garcia. And that concludes the Michael Davies story. It is just. It is quite interesting, really. Fate constantly trying to bring Father Garcia and Father Ward onto the same path. Michael Davies really has no connection to the Martin household, to the Martin debacle that we know of.
So it seems very strange that Michael Davies would cross paths with Father Ward. I don't know, it's just very interesting. It's 2 a.m. Boom! This is where the nightmare begins. And we truly start Chapter 2 with Father Ward. I notice the stones we are standing in between form a five-pointed shape, perhaps a gram of the penta variety. We will be keeping these stones in mind. We approach a tree, seemingly defiled with bones and bloody remains. Exercising it reveals Note 2, a notice advising people to stay away from the cemetery while this investigation is postponed. And there's that state of Connecticut Historical Society. Maybe I was wrong to assume that they wouldn't come up again in this story. We approach the cemetery. Going inside, we see eight gravestones. Exercising the upper right gravestone yields note three, a sort of haiku. I shook hands with the devil. I looked him in the eye. He looked like a long lost friend. Heading north, we find a tomb with the title save on it. We also find note four next to it with the same red ink. It's a set of instructions written by none other than Gary. The instructions tell us that we can save the game by walking into the save family tomb. Also, there are three steps to a set of instructions that cryptically give us the way to unlock the bad ending for this chapter. Understand that this will be the first time that Father Ward has heard of the unspeakable, at least canonically. Also, goes without saying, we will be keeping the unspeakable in mind. But the reason why I bring up the unspeakable being brought up for the first time canonically in chapter two is because I think this brings home the point that these are more than just dreams. We are being given information in these dreams, evil information or information regarding evil things that Father War shouldn't know about. If it was purely a non inconsequential, just dumb waste of time dream, it would be based on stuff that we have seen. And, or have heard of, and the unspeakable is just not one of those things. There's no way he would know about this unless from an external source. We enter the tomb. The title on the screen says, Enter the Spirit House. We see what looks to be three thralls sitting solemnly, and across from us is a mirror. Walking to the first thrall from the bottom shows us a woman with one of the demonic letters on her forehead. The next thrall is a shirtless, scruffy man with symbols carved on his chest. The last one has the most typical thrall look, bald, shirtless, with symbols on his forehead and chest. Approaching the mirror shows a cutscene of the reflection of Father Ward, brandishing a key and creepily smiling. Leaving the mirror shows three souls escaping from the three thralls. In directions of the locations, we'll be fighting three different demon mini-bosses associated with each of these three thralls' backstories. We will be keeping these three unique thralls in mind. We head to the left to see four statues pointed in different directions. Oh, a puzzle. I love puzzles. We go south to see if the statues are relevant here. This area is obscured by clouds, but no, I don't... Holy mother of God, what is that thing? Ah, stop, it's a demon baby. Well, that wasn't a puzzle. I was expecting a puzzle, not a demon baby. After loading back, we head north instead. Remember that these statues are pointing right, up, left, and up again. So we follow that pattern. We catch a glimpse of our adversary before he spawns in. The demon is the easiest to fight of the three. He gets close, but then will randomly blink away. But don't get cocky. Still evade, but you can afford to pursue this demon a bit more aggressively. After defeating it, we pick up note five. We will come to find out that this is the note written by the scruffy male thrall. Note 5. I have been freed. No more overbearing father turned violent alcoholic. No more hiding my bruises and cuts. No more pills and needles. No more getting laughed at and kicked around. They'll never laugh at me again. By day, my body withers away. But by night, my mind explores forbidden worlds of power and knowledge, guided by beings of pure darkness. I have been trusted with secret knowledge of the demon seal. I have learned the correct conjuring sign, drawing the inverted star along the rocks arranged in five, first at the top left point and then down. I will lure them into the woods, then I will show them my power. This conjuring sign will be of help getting the bad ending in this chapter. The scruffy thrall is mentioning this same shape, this five point stone shape 
This Thrall's account is one of the ways people get sucked into the second death cult. His story is unique. His story and the other two Thralls will be emblematic of some way people get sucked in, different ways people get sucked in. In his case, it was alienation, ostracization. He was angry, he was bitter, and so he chose in full agency to join an evil cult so he could potentially gain power to levy the pain and suffering he's felt onto other people. It, he, his, his way, his reasoning, I think, is objectively evil. That cannot be said about the other two counterparts. We enter the safe family tomb and save our game and notice that the scruffy thrall is missing. You'll notice that every time we beat a demon, their associated thrall will also disappear. Knowing that the difficult baby demon lurks to the left, we see what's going on in the right. We follow a path to a purple skull, and on this path we pass by a statue of a black robed figure bearing a cross. We head back up around and exercise the purple skull, opening the gate to the next demon boss. Heading back down, we see that the statue turned around and moved towards us. Passing by it, we see footsteps follow behind us and stop. We enter the next boss fight zone and- Seriously? Demon fetus? So if hell was like a hospital, then the second death cult would be getting its recruits from the NICU? We will be keeping the We will be keeping this neonatal theme in mind. Baby. Now this is a very predictable boss. Simply exercise it when it pursues you, repelling it, then move vertically in the opposite direction when it starts sliding across the screen. Keep playing this boss safe and eventually you'll defeat it. We pick up note 8. This note was written by the female thrall in the safe family tomb. Note 8. Nobody was thrilled when I got pregnant. Not even a little happy. Even my doctors seemed to be judging me. Each time I'd leave the doctor's office, I'd see this strange woman across the street. All she'd do is stare at me and smile. No words. Just a big, warm smile. Somehow, it made those visits a little more bearable. After I lost the baby, I saw her again across the street from the doctor's office. Her smile was as big as ever, but somehow not as warm and friendly as I remembered. Yesterday I was walking and was shocked to see the woman standing in the middle of the path. Now she was pregnant. She beckoned towards me. I followed her off the path and into the woods. And that's when I met Gary. And so that is the theming of this unique thrall, the theming of the neonatal. There is this theme of baby snatching, miscarriages, and just this cult preying on women who have gone through miscarriages. This is a big, big keep in mind for things we're going to learn in chapter 3. This thrall's story, unique story, I think plays, or I should say it has the most linkage the most in common with the story that we're going to be concerned about in the story of faith. She's definitely not as immoral as the scruffy one. What she went through is not her fault whatsoever, but she still ended up choosing, albeit in a vulnerable sort of duress, to side with or listen to Gary's pitch. We go back to the safe family tomb to find that the female thrall is missing, and all we have left is the demon baby. So on our second try, we are a bit more prepared. The trick with this demon is to play more defensively and evasively. It will dash between clouds. So if you can stay out of all possible pathways, you will stay safe. It will take you longer to defeat it, but it's the safest method. We pick up note six, the note written by the bald thrall with the many tattoos. Note six, losing grandpa was the hardest thing I ever experienced. We were really close. I cried about it for weeks. Then my stepmom introduced me to some of her friends. They asked me, would you like to see your grandfather again? I missed him so much. I was willing to try anything. That night, my stepmom drove me to one of her friends' house. They took me down to the basement. I saw my grandfather in there, only it wasn't actually him. When I tried to run, they closed the basement door and locked me in. I can't remember much else from that night. My stepmom's friends are always coming by the house now. They tell me I have a debt to pay. They say they have work for me to do. This one is very upsetting. And so here's the theming with the final thrall. And that is the theming of the doomed child. The child that didn't have a chance from the beginning. 
It's so upsetting. We start with the first thrall. And by the way, this isn't in any particular order. We could have gone in any different orders, but let's start. We start with the first thrall. He chose the path of darkness. He desired the path of darkness. He wanted to sh make other people suffer purely because he suffered. We have the second thrall who, of course, pre-cult was 100% victim, but got sucked in, chose to get sucked in, into the cult. And then finally, we have the bald thrall who didn't even have a choice, was caught up when he was a child. And it makes sense. He's bald, he's got the tattoos, he looks the most like the typical thrall that we see in the rest of the game. It makes sense that he is transformed this much compared to the other two because he's been in it ever since he was a child. And it is frustrating. It's somehow even more frustrating that it's like the stepmom that got him. It's just, it's such, this is so real. It's such a, just a brutal story, honestly. But that doesn't end. It doesn't end. We will still be keeping these three lost souls in mind. It's also pretty interesting. The demon that's associated with the scruffy man kind of looks like a wizard. The scruffy man wanted to fully embrace the mystical side and the sorceress side of the cult. The demon associated with the woman was very explicitly a fetus. There's not much needing, you know, that's obvious link right there. And what's strange is the bald thrall was a baby, a, a crying baby. And I think this is to symbolize, and this is complete conjecture, the sort of arrested development, having your agency seized by this cult. I cannot wait till we destroy them. We go back to the safe family tomb to see the statue outside of it contorted in a very odd shape, like something you'd see on the monument mythos. Entering the tomb, we approach our reflection, which is already there, mind you, to see the reflection of Father Ward stab himself in the eye with a key. We pick up the key and proceed. Whoa, 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 hold on, run that back one more time. Now this is interesting. Every time we neutralized a demon associated with one of these thralls, one of these glowing skulls would stop glowing, but there's four of them and three of these. It isn't until the apparition, or not apparition, the reflection of Father Ward stabs himself in the eye that last one, that last glowing skull fades away. And there's just something there. There's something there that means something. We just don't have enough data yet, but I don't even know how I'm gonna write this on the board. Just keep that in mind. We head north and pass through a gate, materializing a whole new section to the cemetery around us. This is kind of our first hint that all of this is a dream. Suddenly, demon tree and, oh crap. Don't worry. This is a fake out. None of these trees are demons. And from here on out, none of the demons are trees. That is the one time we've ever seen that demon and we're never gonna see it again. We arrive to the Snake Meadow Hill Church and we see a child run up into the cornfield. We pick up note 10, another haiku-like note. She guards the door to the underground purgatory. I have not seen her. Children fear her. We enter the church and the game gives us a hint as to what to do first. Confess thy sins. We pick up note 12, a journal entry for day one of a ghost hunting investigation. This note mentions local rumors of evil spirits dragging children into the cornfields and a secret tunnel system under the chapel. We were familiarized with the cornfield demon in the prologue, but in chapter two, we will become more acquainted with this secret tunnel system that Sister Miriam surely used in the kidnapping of the orphan. The note also mentions a game to summon a ghost called the Spindly Lady. We enter the confessional room to exercise another purple skull. Exercising it reveals note 13, a desperate account of Lars being stuck in the basement, Henry gone missing, and the author not being able to leave. The tapes that hold whatever paranormal proof that they came to collect have gone missing as well. We enter the confessional. Pray for me, Father, for I have sinned. I tried to save a girl from evil, but my fears overcame me. I turned my back on the ministry and broke my vows to God. A year later, the girl reached out to me again, but in the end, I couldn't save her. I left her to die. I am sorry for me and my past sins. 
The demon is asking us to bring him a child. The child he's referring to is the one we saw on the outside of the church. We will be keeping this doomed child in mind. After that truly unsacramental confession, we find our way into the secret area hidden behind the confessional, a familiar hallway with the Virgin Mary. And underneath one of the candles is a blood stain. Exercising the icon of the Virgin Mary gives us note 14. This account takes us to night one. Our ghost hunters on their ghost adventure also find the secret corridor. On top of that, they even catch an EVP, an electronic voice phenomenon, of somebody laughing, very similar to the cackling that we heard the night things hit the fan with Sister Miriam and the orphans. The question is, who is the one laughing? Sister Miriam or the spindly lady? I think we are meant to think it's the spindly lady at first, but m more fingers point toward it being Sister Miriam. We go to the chapel area and exercise that sacrilegious act. It's the gritty so hard. It's the gritty so hard. We go to the chapel area and exercise that same sacrilegious glass icon again from the prologue. Note the demonic arm coming out of this saint's face. Exercising it reveals note 15, an account of the ghost hunters on night two. Things seem to be ramping up. They catch video proof of candles lighting up on their own while the investigators are playing the spindly lady game. Looking at the other glass icons, we see that they are normal images. An angel, what looks to be a saint, and a cross surrounded by a bunch of colors. We head to the right to enter a small room that might be where the overflow parishioners typically go during the more crowded masses. We head north to a room with a cross on the table, similar to the one in the prologue, but this time with an eye on it. Remember that little poem we read before coming into the church, I hath not seen her? Maybe a connection? A cross spookily drops on the floor as we notice the writing on the wall, a hint as to how to play the game. Simply move from room to room until there is only one candle lit, but do not switch rooms rapidly because it will cause the spindly lady to kill you instantly. Walk the church room to room and maybe you will see her. If you move, then she will too, but never try to trick her. This is that song that was mentioned in note 12. All the crosses fall on the floor, and so begins the spindly lady. Did I really fucking write this? <laughs> All the crosses fall on the floor, and so begins the spindly lady ice bucket cinnamon bend it like Beckham challenge. I wrote that at 4 a.m., I'm sorry. We finally find the spindly lady, and here is the tricky part, fighting her. She isn't hard, it's just dying to her can set you back pretty far time-wise in the game. Wait for her to teleport three times, and after the third time, she will pause and dash at your immediate direction. Simply move out of the way and exercise her as she's passing by. After beating her, simply go back to the chapel and descend into the secret basement. Again, darkness surrounds us. We get note 17, the final account of Father Clark, once he's trapped in the basement. In author of Father Clark, I'm going to read this myself. Note 17. This is my final memoir, hastily scribbled on a page from the good book. I now descend the staircase, knowing full well that she waits for me ahead. Checking my old watch has revealed something quite astonishing. Time doesn't change down here as we know it on the surface. Even now, the hands don't move past two o'clock. God's work be done. I have been to where only the faintest light shine and protect from things unspeakable. God help me, Father Clark, a foolish old man, going mad in this dark prison, ears bleeding from the screams of the demon. And that is the last we will hear from Father Clark. His fate sealed in the secret basement. Rest in peace, Father Clark. This is one of the more beautifully terrifying notes of the game. I won't lie, I had my suspicions of Father Clark. But the man was brave. He descended into this topsy-turvy, nonsensical realm of timelessness to save the little ones. And there's that 2 a.m., by the way. It was 2 a.m. when we first started Chapter 2 as Father Ward, and I'm sure there must have been some references to it in even the prologue that I may have missed. We go down one screen and see this obscured shadow of Amy go into the next room, 
we examined the diagram on the ground. Oh, another puzzle. It resembles a clock. So we start from the two o'clock position. Going into the next room, we see the symbols on the ground. So I try to repeat the patterns from memory as best I can. It seems I make a mistake and I hear that danger motif getting closer and louder. I flee to the left edge of the screen and this unspeakable demonic dust bunny of evil almost gets me before slinking away. I try again. I mess up and this time the dust bunny gets me. Can you really call it a puzzle if it's just memorization? I finally break the seal of the unspeakable and make it to a solemn scene. We see in blood red writing, mother of demons and six of the stick dolls, one for every child that she kidnapped. Like, what does that even mean? I mean, obviously the mother of demons is referring to sister of Miriam and it's just like, damn. And you know, and each of these stick dolls represents one of those victims, you know, it, it, but yeah, mother of demons, that's referring to Sister Miriam, and the stick dolls are just the victims. Ooh. Keep this in mind. Keep the title of mother in mind. Oh my, mother of demons. Oh my gosh, I am just discovering this. Keep that in mind. We'll be keeping this title of mother in mind. It's just a little, little cool thing I just realized. We made it. We're in the fresh outdoors. The Moonlight Sonata from Chapter 1 is playing, and... Oh, my day is ruined. We see three bodies here, and what I believe to be note 18. We read that the bodies belong to Sandra Atwood, Angel Nogales, and Troy Ingalls. The first letter of each of their names can spell out Satani, a Latin form of the name Satan. If you're skimming through the letter, you might miss the random pandemonium regnat, which translates to pandemonium reigns, or chaos reigns. This is what the thralls scream in your face when they kill you. I don't have an example of them killing me just because I'm that sick with it. The note takes a quick turn. Note 18, starting at the arrangement. The arrangement of the bodies in a ritualistic pattern, as well as the writing of certain symbols in blood, matches the style of several murders that have occurred in the Sterling area since 1986. The killings may be connected to last week's brutal slaying of Amy Martin, a 17-year-old girl, by John Ward. Ward had impersonated a priest to gain Amy's trust before luring her into the woods and killing her. Investigators are asking residents to report any suspicious activity to the police. Authorities are urging the people of Sterling to not mourn the loss of Atwood, Nogales, and Ingalls, because after all, they were degenerate devil-worshipping thugs who were hooked on crack cocaine and hated their parents. Why even conduct an investigation at all? That's what you would like them to think, wouldn't you, John? They were just three pathetic outcasts who got what they deserved. You actually did a community a favor when you found them getting high in that tomb. You stalked them through the graves and killed them one by one. You ignored their cries for help, their pleas for mercy. You put holes in their ruined drug addict bodies and then you chopped off their heads because everybody knows that removing their head is the only way to kill a snake. Well, guess what? You didn't kill the snake, John. You cannot kill what cannot... <coughs> <coughs> You cannot kill what cannot be killed. Thou shalt not raise up what thou canst not put down again. Thou could not kill Amy. Thou shalt not destroy my works, for they are of the works of the eternal dragon. Even now, she is at thy door. Her hand is at thy throat. Yet you see her not. I will have thy soul, for I am the god of this world. <laughs> and in Amy's purple text, I'm here, John. I want to point this out for chapter three. We hear in a really grating computerized voice, you are mine priest. After reading this really long note, I think this is a motif for whenever Father Ward is about to be under the influence of demonic control, or, or in this case, turned into a demonic creature. If we try reading the note in the main menu, it will not show up. The game tells us we can't seem to remember this note. We see Father Ward caught in a ritual triangle between the three corpses now standing and on fire. Five cultists are watching, and we even see Amy standing behind a tree. Father Ward gets rendered into holy lard. That's what they're going to call me if I ever join seminary school. We are turned into a... Don't laugh. That wasn't funny. That was a test and you failed. 
we are turned into our demon form, just like in the alternate ending of the prologue. It occurred to me, whenever we get turned into this demon form, I say whenever, there's only two times we do get turned into it in chapter two, the prologue and right now, we see amongst us similarly colored stick dolls. All of us are colored gray. What if this is telling us that Father Ward is just as wrapped up in this whole machination as much as the countless victims that are represented by these stick dolls? What if at some point in his history he's been marked in some way, either for initiation or killing or manipulation or, you know, utilization, if you will? And this sort of demonic crawler form, which in the game files refers to as the wretch, is just the actual form that these stick dolls are based off of. This is conjecture, but worry not, we will be getting a lot of clarity regarding Father Ward's place in all of this in Chapter 3. After skittering around and finding our way across this demon realm, we cross under a bridge that would give the F car subreddit an aneurysm. There is a couple fixing their car on that bridge. We will be keeping this couple in mind, and we are back to our holy self. We enter a drain tunnel labeled Candy Tunnel with three of the stick dolls standing atop the entrance. Part of me wonders if these dolls represent the three thralls that we got to know. It's almost like these thralls are saying bye to us as we enter the next phase of our nightmare. We enter what we will soon find out to be a den for addicts and perhaps other people who tend to dwell in the margins of society. We see some eye graffiti to the left, perhaps telling us that if it's the cult we are looking for, we are headed in the right direction. We head to the right and find some human remains. We exercise them and read note 19. It's titled, Multiple Officers Wounded, One Dead in Sewer Tunnel Shootout. It looks to be a news article accounting officers down in the raid of the candy tunnels, the very tunnels that we are in. The raid was to locate and catch a suspected murderer, Joe Bauman, known to be as the candy store killer. The paragraph describes the current status of the raid ongoing even during the publishing. One officer was dead, it isn't known how many were wounded, and officials weren't disclosing whether or not Bauman was wounded in this exchange. And on top of that, there is this struggle and effort being made to recover the casualties from the tunnels. This paints a dreadful picture. A raid group of armed police officers storming a drain tunnel and they're getting picked off one by one. They can't even retrieve the casualties. They can't even give a good number or I should say status on some of these officers on the status of the serial killer that they're trying to detain. Knowing what we know about the forces we're dealing with here, this is likely not a mere mortal they're dealing with. We will be keeping this police raid in mind. Exploring the first area further, we see these grates on the wall adorned with graffiti. We find another set of remains to find Note 20, giving us some more backstory to these tunnels, confirming that they are the home for addicts, runaways, and the indigent, but have been the site of a grisly murder scene. The note accounts the public urging the police to search these tunnels in fear it has connection to the candy store killer. So despite this note being collected and numbered after the failed raid note, it looks like this article takes place chronologically before the raid did. This gives me a tad bit of confusion. If it's not yet confirmed this tunnel has a connection to the candy store killer, then why is it called the candy tunnel? Maybe the names are a coincidence, or maybe the rumor of a connection stuck and locals named it the Candy Tunnel even before getting this established connection. We proceed to explore for deeper access to the tunnel until we see a thrall dash behind and along the drain grates. We follow to the right and see that there is a drain grate with arrows pointing up. He heads straight up when at that drain grate. This is a hint as to how to get deeper once we get access behind those grates. We explore to find four pillars with graffiti warning us when you see it, don't move. We'll have to keep this hint in mind. Who knows when it's going to be relevant. This is the peekaboo demon. It all makes sense. When he says, Mother, when he's peeking around the corner, he's referring to Sister Miriam. It's got to be. We just saw that scene. 
So we will be keeping this peekaboo demon in mind, the dweller within the candy tunnels. After that encounter, we follow a blood trail to find it leads directly into a wall. Creepy. We head up past the broken grate and head right. The trail of blood continues past the wall and into this star-shaped pit, likely where the peekaboo demon went. We find note 22, which ties a nice, neat bow on the police raid substory. Note 22. When I was a boy, my nana used to tell me old legends about the dragons, trolls, and demons that lived up in the mountains of Norway. In those old tales, the people were never strong enough to kill the monsters, so instead they would sacrifice one of their own to appease it, keep it satisfied. It was like a deal with the devil, one sacrifice per year so that the beast would not come down from the mountain and slaughter the entire village. There was no candy store killer. What we're dealing with is not even human. When I got separated from the other officers, I saw the damn thing dragging what was left of Jenkins down into that lair. That's when I understood. The bums and the tweakers, the ones with grid and the child prostitute runaways, they'll eventually come back to the tunnels. They always do. It can have them, for all I care. Nobody wants them around, except maybe that thing. And I tell you what, I hope to God it never gets tired of them. So that trail of blood is likely from Jenkins. And the thing that was dragging him, the thing that was referred to in that note, is very much likely the peekaboo demon. Is the peekaboo demon the serial killer, the candy store killer? I don't think so. I think that the police raid may have been offered some sort of false intel, maybe in bad faith. But no, I think that this police raid, peekaboo demon versus the police raid, um, was a sort of unfortunate mi uh, mishap that this Pikachu demon is not what they were looking for. They sort of went in thinking they were going to get a mortal serial killer, and what they walked into was Pikachu demon uh, ready to get him his munch on. I mean, and it makes sense. I mean, it's a demon after all. It probably he probably throws hands as well as he wears them. We head left now. We pass where we would normally walk up, but to explore a little bit more, we keep going left. We find note twenty one an account by an addict who notes crazy people painted red with animalistic gazes, thralls of course, and hearing noises coming from within the tunnel like a woman laughing and inhuman noises that sound like they're coming from something very big. Now we are far past the locus of the spindly lady so I think it's safe to say the cackling motif or symbol or theme or whatever that we heard about in the orphanage behind the painting, that is Sister Miriam's cackling. We go back to the grate with the arrow graffiti and follow this direction up. After traveling deeper and deeper into the tunnels, we enter the next section with candles adorning the floors. Something tells me that addicts don't get to this point of the tunnels. We head right to see the next part of the tunnel adorned with red graffiti. Aside from the demonic letters, the two eyes on either side of the entrance makes this hole look like a large gaping maw. We see a blood trail. We head left to follow it to some writing on the wall. The writing states, I'm sorry God, please save me. A chilling final message punctuated by blood splatters. We follow the blood path back to the other side. We find ourselves in a familiar situation, a dark room with a flashlight. We pick it up to find ourselves facing the basement demon once again, but this time in the candy tunnel. We fight him the same way we did before, and after defeating him, we head north to see a thrall dart from behind a pillar. Go and head straight for the deeper parts of the tunnel. We follow north. Following demonic symbols on the floor, the thrall waits for us and runs to warn the others. He is here. You know how they have like Sam and then better Sam? Well, I'm better, better Sam. He is here. We enter the next area, labeled with what I learned to be the Enochian alphabet. Converting this to our alphabet, it says Domus Malfas, Latin for home of Malfas. We will be keeping Malfas in mind. Let's take inventory right here of all of our antagonists. You have the unspeakable, you have Malfas, you have Sister Miriam, you have Gary. All of them under this sort of umbrella, or at least associative umbrella, of the Second Death Cult. With our flashlight, we search around. We find an ornate door that's locked, and in blood, they hate the light. This is a hint as to how to deal with the next enemies. You see, they can't be exercised. They resemble giant cultists with heavily torn garb. They look very, almost statuesque, 
and with twitching heads. Honestly, this is one of the most this. Honestly, this is one of the more creepy enemies. <laughs> Stupid. Honestly, this is one of the more creepier enemies, especially just the more you look at them, you translate the Atari graphics to real life graphics, and it's just. We maneuver our flashlight to corral them, noticing demonic arms blocking our path. We loop around to exercise a painting of Miriam. On our way, we see hallucinations of the stick doll and the twins. We enter the next room. We head up to find a room with a note locked behind three runes. One with Father Ward's wretched form, one with the child outside the church, and another with a pentagram. We will revisit this after this playthrough. This is only relevant for the bad ending or evil playthrough. Now, check this out. The glitchy sound effect is the same one that we hear when Amy creeps above the bed in chapter one. And then what we hear sounds like sirens or maybe just a nondescript creepy sound effect. I've played through chapter through a couple of times and I always run into some variation of this sort of sound effects followed by a hallucination of the twins. I don't know if it's like full blown scripted, but it's definitely like a really cool just moment that honestly freaked me out when I was recording all of this. Anyways, we pick up the key and head back to the ornate door. We enter through the door and get ambushed by Sister Miriam. Just like in the prologue ending, she says, here I am and my little one. Sister Miriam lumbers towards us and is surprised, exercised by the great priest, Father Garcia. Now, remember this scene, because this is an example of the really subtle foreshadowing for chapter three. Now, this represents Father Garcia, but I'm not entirely sure just yet how much of this is just a representat representation of, of Father Garcia or an actual sort of bilocated apparition. Father Garcia actually channeling himself into Father War's dream. I mean, it's not out of the question. I think it's somewhere in the middle. I think that Father Garcia is praying, trying to make some sort of intercession for Father Ward. But what Father Ward is experiencing is an incomplete sort of manifestation of Father Garcia. You see, even if we meet Father Garcia canonically in chapter one, we never hear him speak. We never hear him refer to himself as Father Garcia. That's why in chapter two, he never speaks Spanish. You know, he says, hijo to Michael when we actually see him, but in cha chapter two, the, the dream sequence, the nightmare sequence, he's speaking English the entire time, and he never refers to himself as Father Garcia. So there is some sort of still limitations with how much it can, you know, Father Garcia can communicate with Father Ward as far as being purely based off of information that he knows. He doesn't maintain the same supernatural powers that the unspeakable Malthus, Gary, etc., etc they have. There's something wholesomely poetic about Father Garcia and Father Ward's paths crossing and moving in parallel. Both of them are men of the cloth. Both of them are tormented by the children that they failed. Both of them are significant antagonistic forces against the cult of the second death. They are both driven to some obsession, both in their own unique ways. We'll come to find out that Father Garcia wants to levy this entire widespread war against the unspeakable, while Father Ward is more obsessed with righting the wrongs that happened to Amy. Although Father Ward doesn't know anything about Father Garcia, it's just serendipitous that they would come to cross each other's paths. A match made in heaven, if you will. I'm realizing that Father Garcia is sort of the spirit guide in this last part of the chapter, reassuring us about how the misfortune that beset Amy are not Father Ward's fault, even though by his calling, it's still his responsibility to make the situation right, to finish what he started. Also, 
he assures us that we are no murderer. Now, this is key. What Father Garcia tells us is very much key. In case it wasn't obvious, that one note where it goes kind of crazy with the pandemonium regnat and the 666 cross and whatnot, those accusations of Father Ward having murdered Amy and murdered these three junkie uh, thralls is complete fabrication. It's purely a deception. Hey, remember what we talked about, that little aside in chapter one about the priestly or religious concept of deception, that's one of those things. And although it's more of a, a, a legit deception because it is a lie that is meant to shake Father Ward's fate. Sorry, faith and fate in a way. Along with our spirit guide, we exercise Sister Miriam Bell. I ward off thralls as they dash for Father Garcia. Afterwards, her attack patterns are mimicries of bosses we've already faced. We keep fighting her until the end. She suddenly transforms into something truly unspeakable. And we wake up. That's it. That's chapter two. The final sequence has three variations. The great ending, the good ending, and the bad ending. We pick up note 24, a note from Molly, seemingly a response to our letter to her, saying that she can't do this anymore and that she will always love John back. Perhaps our priest had fallen in love with somebody in the past. It happens. It's hard to ask somebody who is called to the marriage of religious life to forego on the beauties that is human companionship. We leave the bedroom and head down a hallway to pass a door covered in crosses. I'm not going in there. We head into the kitchen and pick up Note 26, a medical release written on October 31st, 1986 by none other than Dr. Spinell, the doctor referenced in Father Ward's appeal to be released from psychiatric care. He is diagnosed and is released with mild anxiety and acute cholerophobia. Anxiety, I get, it explains a lot that weighs on Father Ward's mental health, but I'm curious as to when the fear of clowns is or will become relevant. Aside from the clown on the birthday invitation in Chapter 1, we don't really ever see any clowns in this game, but I could be wrong. We try to go into the basement, and again, I'm not going in there. I'm not going in there. This will make more sense in chapter three. So we will be keeping this hallway door and basement in Father Ward's home in mind. We pick up the letter at our doorstep. I believe this to be note 25, but it's variant based on whether you get the great or good ending, which is why when trying to reread it in the main menu, it says you can't remember it. We have the great ending. So our note reads, this is note 25, variant good ending. Great ending. John, we don't have much time. The profane Sabbath is almost upon us. If they find Nate and Jason, they will perform a ritual on them and call forth a demon of unspeakable power. The name of the demon is Malfas. I am in the process of discovering their whereabouts. I will contact you again soon. We must not let them do to the boys what they did to Amy. Father Garcia. Father Garcia knows about Malfas, Amy, and the twins. This guy has been doing his homework while we were snoozing. My nightmares are getting worse. Ever since I left that house, I am haunted by visions of demons. I finished my work with Amy, but now the boys are in danger. This time I must not fail. Malfas must be stopped. As the profane sap of draws closer, the workers of darkness grow stronger. This will be my greatest test of faith yet. God have mercy on my soul. This is the go forth in faith ending, the great ending. But if the player fails to protect Father Garcia in the final fight, or does some of the evil rituals required for the bad ending, but not all, we get a different note. Um, I don't have footage of this ending because I've played chapter two so many times. Um, and I, I just, I just, you know what, I'm going to be lazy this one moment. I'm just going to give you information based off of what I find on the internet. Garcia's alternate letter. John, it's not too late. Your soul can still be saved. All is not lost. Please wait for my next letter. For now, I have many questions that need answering. In the meantime, be careful. They are watching you. Father Garcia. After reading the note, a similar cutscene happens, but the dialogue is different. I survived the nightmare, but did I really do the right thing? I don't know what's real anymore. My faith is weak. 
and I feel a dark shadow over me. If I can save the boys, maybe I will find what I'm looking for. And before that cutscene ends, we see a thrall or cultist tailing us. This is the road to redemption ending, the good ending. Actually, honestly, it's more of a bittersweet ending. I think this tells us that how we perform in the dreams has very real consequences in the real world. Specifically, succumbing to the anxieties and to the nightmares and whatnot increases the amount of time he needs to sleep, shows his whereabouts to the cult, and increases the amount of power the cult has over him. I think that's why Father Garcia says, it's not too late, your soul can still be saved, all is not lost. I think when he says, it isn't too late, he means this both temporally and soteriologically. <laughs> imagine, <laughs> imagine if I just didn't explain what any of that pretentious crap meant. <laughs> What I mean by this is, temporally, time, it isn't too late. This is conjecture, but I think the worse we do in the shoes of Father Ward, the, the more time we lose as we're sleeping. We'll see themes like this in chapter 3, where when we're doing very poorly, we wake up the next day and the progress towards the Black Sabbath or the, un the Unholy Sabbath uh, is more quicker, has more progress towards it, more time passes. And so theologically, I mean Father Ward's grace, the state of his soul, his salvation. When we have the, not the great ending, but, or the bad ending, but the sort of bittersweet ending, Father Garcia is telling us it's not too late, you can still save your soul. You've sinned, you've done bad things in your dream, you let me die, or you did some of the rituals, but it's not too late. I think it's definitely guaranteed it has to do with his soul, but I also do think that this was some foreshadowing to actual, like, time, like, time being affected by Father Ward's performance regarding the mystical, spiritual dream world. Conjecture. Rambling. We'll move on. Now let's get into the evil ending and clean up any of the notes that we may have missed out on. After the part where the reflection of Father Ward stabs himself in the eye, we will be dripping blood. If we follow note four, we know that the first direction is to conjure his demon. We actually get instructions from this from note five, the note written from the bitter thrall who made a conjuring sign using stones formed in a fine point pentagram. I only know of one other place that has that, and that's at the beginning of this nightmare. We make our way back to the five rocks at the beginning and begin to use the blood to create the upside down pentagram. After completing the ritual, we hear in a demonic voice, Pandemonium Regnant. Hmm. I may have failed to mention this. I don't know. I'm sorry if I'm repeating this already. We're going through a lot of information. So you remember that fox that says chaos reigns? You know how um, the thralls, when they kill you, they say chaos reigns? Well, the demon in this case, and the phrase that we kept seeing in the scary note was pandemonium regnat. Pandemonium, uh, pan meaning sort of the large proliferation, and demonium meaning demon kind, large proliferation and armies of demons, regnant meaning reigns, but we use the word pandemonium to also describe chaos. So pandemonium regnat is sort of the Latinized version of the phrase chaos reigns, again the catchphrase of this evil cult. We fight off this charging demon, although it's very easy to beat the sound design as I'm gonna, the robe is enough. No, the robe is enough. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna talk normally, okay? So although it's very easy to beat, the sound design as well as the leaning and rushing look of this demon is so creepy, I could totally see it catching somebody by surprise and leading to a game over. After beating the demon, we pick up note 9, what looks to be a cursory initial evaluation of John Ward after the exorcism of Amy Martin. The author notes that Father Ward was non-responsive the first half hour then start to give fragmented accounts of the exorcism. The author also notes Father Ward's inability to maintain a consistent account of the story, especially when confusing whether the exorcism took place in the basement or in the attic. The author then finally notes Father Ward's insistence on the incident being a result of demonic possession, and the author can't declare him of sound mind. What's interesting is the author mentions the Martin family attorneys at the very end of this note. But remember, the first time we hear this phrase, chaos reigns, is when we're looking at this sacrificed fox in between five stones in a very similar situation as what we're dealing with right now. So, thus completes 
I don't even know how to draw these things, you know, I don't even know how to draw it, which is a good thing. Thus completes the first ritual. Now on to the second step of completing our initiation. Remember that confessional with the demon in it? Remember how he said, bring the child to me? This is us being told how we're going to do the second step of note four, to serve his demon. The only child I know of is the one hiding outside the church. We have to first beat the spindly lady to win the child's trust. We will find the child outside north of the church, where we will see that scarecrow again. Now we don't want to face the child. Doing so will cause the child to call us a bad man and run away. Exercising the scarecrow gives us note 11. But before we read that, check out the scarecrow's face. Ooh, remember this tableau. I didn't even notice this until now. Look at the picture of the scarecrow. There's a triangular... Oh, hold on, where am I gonna draw this? Remember this tableau here, a small child being warded over by a creepy figure with a creepy triangular smile and a very large eye. Ooh, this is foreshadowing. This is definitely foreshadowing. Note 11 is written by the associate who swore off the ministry in Note 29, who, despite their promises, had to come back to the cornfield one last time five years after the cornfield incident. Not knowing what they were looking for, they eventually come face to face with, with what they refer to as the doomed child. The child instantly darts away into the cornfield, much like how the child we're dealing with right now runs away when we first face it. But the author caught a glimpse of the child's face, describing them having a bloody gaping hole. This is much like the bloody red hole that we see on Amy's face. We lead the doomed child into the confession room and we see out of the corner of our eye a shadow form of Amy slinking away again, almost leading us to the confessional. We lead the doomed child in front of the confessional and a demonic hand grabs and pulls them in. After walking into the confessional ourselves, we get pulled in as well, where we face the mirror demon from chapter one's secret boss fight. After defeating it, we get note 16, a note with a scathing skeptical reduction of Father Ward's torment, deeming him as somebody with a savior complex. The author in the final paragraph of the note angrily pleads for somebody to move Amy to another facility because somehow Father Ward knows she's in there with him. I am of the mind that we're not supposed to see the doctor's take on Father Ward's mental health as entirely accurate. We will come to find out that Father Ward does not want to be a savior. He has debilitating fear, cowardice even. The actions he does to save Amy and the twins is not out of a savior complex, but out of a deep, profound sense of guilt. This is my conjecture though, and now we have confirmation that Amy and Father Ward were in fact placed in the same facility. Also, with the sacrificing of the doomed child, Thus completes the second ritual. One more to go. For the third instruction of the initiation, we are to walk among the children as his demon, according to note four. So after we turn into a wretch and we walk up to where the bridge is, before crossing under it, we double back and make our way up to the couple fixing their car. We simply need to touch them and that will kill them. We have to dodge the incoming truck and proceed as normal and we've completed the initiation and simply need to complete the chapter. And thus completes the third ritual. We are now fully ready to get the evil ending. We just need to finish the chapter. Before starting the Sister Miriam boss fight, we go back to that spot past the blind cultists and pick up note 23. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. We shall visit thee soon. After defeating Sister Miriam and waking from our nightmare, we notice that there is no note on the doormat from Father Garcia. We walk to the kitchen to see our back door open. Walking outside initiates this cutscene. There Father Ward stands beneath the unspeakable, the central demonic entity of the cult of the second death. Alongside us is other cultists, thralls, and that special cultist with a trident, the same one from the offering ending in chapter one. 
I do find it interesting that we didn't end up getting a letter from Father Garcia. It could have been that we still would have gotten the default, it's not too late letter, but because the cult have made it to us in our, in our backyard, they probably saw that letter and it's like, let's, let's just not let Father Ward see that. Or a more sad thought, Father Garcia somehow became privy to Father Ward fully cooperating with the forces of evil and thought, it's just not worth the risk. Nothing is worth the risk. <laughs> Delivering a letter to Father Ward. I think at that point, it's best to just to distance yourself from a tainted asset. But this is all conjecture. Really, it's just another ending with different consequences. And that was note seven, an obituary for the Martin parents. This is the information I kind of already gave you in chapter one, just to sort of clean up this chapter. Things that we already know. Bob Martin, the father, is uh, associated with the Navy SEALs. The mother is a stay-at-home mom slash accountant. However, we do get confirmation at the end of this obituary that the parents are survived by Amy and the twins, which is very interesting. But we'll get into why that's interesting in chapter three. We don't have really much in the ways of a standard synopsis and wrap up. We really just did everything in a very clean manner. I have a feeling chapter three won't be as clean. So I'll give some final thoughts. Father Ward, has been getting tormented, not only by his own personal anxieties, but by the mystical powers being levied by the second death cult. I have an itching suspicion, however, that Father Ward is somehow more connected than we realize, that this wasn't just a first time bumping into the scenario, that there's some sort of destiny at play here. But we know he's not a bad guy, because the second death cult and the forces within it, their default way of dealing with Father Ward is not initiation or recruitment or temptation. We have to go out of our way to get that ending. The default position is kill Father Ward, get rid of him. He's antagonistic enough to them, whether or not he's aware of this, that they are trying to get rid of him, ASAP. Sister Miriam, Gary, Malfas, and the Unspeakable are going to be the major antagonists in chapter three. Uh, in the corner of the second death cult. The peekaboo demon will be making a small appearance as well as other guest appearances. The twins, the twins, Father Garcia, Amy, and Father Ward will be on the side of good. I mean, of course, Amy is possessed, so she sort of is in that middle ground, but I believe Amy is on the side of good. We will be going back to themes that were first visited in chapter one, things like the clinic, the one that Amy worked at. Characters like that robed guy with the trident, we're gonna finally learn what, like, what his true identity is. And finally get some answers and a location for these elusive twins. Compiling and organizing the information in chapter two clearly has been an undertaking. And chapter three is not gonna be any different. It's probably gonna be a lot more messier and a lot more time consuming. The advantage I had with chapter two is that I had already collected all the notes uh, in one go with chapter one and chapter two. I'm gonna be going into chapter three basically having to start from scratch. It's the biggest level each, it's split up basically into three acts, each one basically being the size of chapter two. It's gonna be a big one. And I have a feeling this is going to be released ahead of schedule, um, but don't, count on chapter three <laughs> being so uh, quickly delivered because there's gonna be a huge process to parsing through that. But man, oh man, did we do good? This is pretty impressive. I better erase this ASAP because I ain't trying to have my family members think I'm into some weird stuff. I'm gonna commit to part three. There are some behind the scenes reasons as to why I need to commit to part three and not do filler videos in between. So there's gonna be a gap, but I'm gonna try my very best to get it out ASAP without sacrificing quality. In the meantime, thank you so much. 3K, 3K subscribers, if not more by the time I'm uploading this. <laughs> it's been insane. It's been absolutely insane. It's been unreal. It's been absolutely unreal. So thank you guys so much for the sweet words, the support, no matter where this goes, I'm so glad. Uh, you guys got to meet me, and I got to meet all you guys. Have a good rest of your day. I'll see you next time. And remember, I will be keeping you in mind. Thanks for watching.